hello and welcome to The Thin Blue Mind. Each week we will be looking at current policing issues and topics within the UK. Our regular panel consists of Steve Bradshaw, who is a TV and theatre actor, Richard Horton, author, and me, Dave Thomas, broadcaster. What we all have in common is over 80 years of combined police service. Now retired, we will be providing opinion and insights from the unique position of having been there and done it. Steve spent the majority of his service on firearms before being promoted to inspector, where he was a force incident manager. Richard was a career detective before going back into uniform as a response sergeant. Myself, I spent the majority of my service on the roads policing unit before going into CID and child protection. You may not agree with everything we say, but we will make you think. The Thin Blue Mind with Bradshaw, Horton and Thomas. Policing insights and opinion. Well, hello, hello and uh, welcome to this week's episode of The Thin Blue Mind. The last one we did was Christmas 2022, wasn't it? How, uh, how's everybody's Christmas and New Year been? Oh, it's been very pleasant for me. Just added to the sum total of joy with a little present to myself, a new guitar. But yeah, life is very good. We could do a musical interlude. Well, like my old man's a dustman. Do I have to bring some 10 P's then to throw at you? So, as I say, this is the first podcast of 2023. Just a, a little bit of breaking news. We're no longer with policing TV. Now, there's lots been going on in the news the last couple of weeks. And it was a tweet that you put on, Richard, about politics and how service in the police has changed our views or perhaps how our views have changed now that we are retired. I, I said in the tweet, I think, basically, um, that for 30 years I'd have to have been fastidiously politically neutral not to have any open political affiliation, mm. not to have, even when I was doing the Nightjack blog, people were saying you could read the blog and not really be any the wiser as to which way I voted come a general election or a local election. So that, that sort of neutrality even crossed over into my anonymous writing. A lot of people are politically neutral, but say political things. And I think in the police, you could actually genuinely be Politically neutral, you could think, well, it doesn't really affect me, but especially when you're quite young in service, you've got other things to worry about, like a mortgage and kids and 35 casemen you've got. You can say political things and people can, because you're a cop, can construe you actually being political when you're not. Something as simple and locally as potholes in the road or you say something at a local village meeting about some decision about a hunt that passes through the village or something, because I've got a personal experience of that. All of a sudden, you're making political comments, and you know how, how fast some people are on the draw of the byro to um, put a complaint in. And I think as well, it's I think it's harder to have a political view now, in so much as, you know, in the past, political views or just personal views were quite nuanced, weren't they? But now yeah. the argument isn't nuanced. It's an either-or argument. And if you're not with me, you're against me. And there's there's all that now in the background. It's a flowchart, isn't it? It's either, you know, the um, the diagram which has a yes or no answer. So, do you agree with Brexit? Yes, go down this route. Do you agree with unrestricted immigration? No, write you down that. Right, you are now that person. Well, you're I, I, you're I, three steps yeah. left of centre. Well, no, I'm not actually, but... I, as a serving organisation, I think it's inarguable that the police have moved from the right that you might think of as um, Chief Constable Amberton back at GMP back in the day. We now have a much more diverse staff, much more yeah. diverse hires and more plurality of opinion. I think it was probably summed up by one of my inspectors um, in a chat one evening in the wee small hours of the morning. You know what it is, Richard, he said. When I joined the police, I thought it would be more right wing than what it is. Mm. And and that's true. It, I I think if you'd have gone back thirty years, swing lamp when I joined, it probably was more right wing as a whole. It was more conservative voting, uh, and and you'd find more commonality with conservative party policies around the sort of Margaret Thatcher era and onwards within policing. But as our hire has changed, as we have more people from uh, all sorts of diverse communities in in the job, as as an aggregate. I think we've moved left as an organisation or more towards the centre. So I'll ask you a question then. You remember that day 30 years ago. Do you think then, comparing then to now, are people more higher level of education now than they did then in the police, would you say? Well, there are more graduates. Would you, sure. <laughs> can, you, can you answer the question, please, Richard? Do you, in your yeah, opinion... Yes, do you, there's more people gone through a higher level of education because we've got more graduates. 
Well, there is the thought that higher education tends to make people more socially liberal. So could that be the change that you've seen then in the police? If people have moved more left or people expected it to be more white wing, is it because there's a bit of a broad brushstroke that people are more educated? There's more education, but there's a greater diversity of, of people within the police yeah. service. And that must be a diversity of opinions as well. We're no longer recruiting from what would be a pool of likely to be to the right in politics. We're recruiting from a much wider pool now. And perhaps that process of going through um, a degree or, or similar um, maybe does affect you and, and maybe does bring you more towards a, a social democracy, a, a liberal point of view. Don't know. Some people it has solidifies the other way. To be fair, um, well, I think my view, and I've nothing to back this up actually, but I think the general level of education was better years ago. But there are more people going to college and university now. Does that make sense? So your basics at school, because how schools teach and how you know they interact with the pupils is is different. But but here's the thing, right? Like we're, we're talking about. We'll, we'll do it in a, a chronological order. So here's a question to you both: Have your political views changed as a result of being a police officer? Not after retirement, because we'll cover that, but just as a result of joining the police. I'd say yes, very definitely. And booking the trend probably about the the notion that the younger you are, the more socially liberal you are, and the older you get, the more right-leaning you are. I had a very superficial view, probably, looking back, of the criminal justice system as a whole. I was very much uh, three strikes and you're out, hang him high, fill the prisons kind of thought. But again, that came from a little bit of ignorance and it came from a little bit of not appreciating the, the, the machine that goes on behind. And I think that l leads into something I've always said before about how open and transparent we are with the public, etc., and be able to teach them that the, the different layers of the criminal justice system. So your experience of the criminal justice system then has kind of softened your view. Yeah, because you see, because you're in it and you're immersed in that world, you actually see those diversionary tactics work. Yeah. And the stats, because I'm a bit of a stats man when it comes to certain things, prove stats it to me. Stats man, that's what we'll call him now. Oh, God, yeah. I can't tell you who won the FA Cup in 1982. And you see from the stats, you see that actually this works because people come out of prison, they go back to an old area, they don't have a house to go to, so oh, they revert to what they know. And if they just had a little bit of a helping hand... You know they could actually turn the lives around, mm. to have, the, and you can, you can see how that's developed through all sorts of different projects and actually getting that intervention within the prison service themselves because prison was a very much a getting that cell, lock that door, and mm. that's it. We'll see, we'll see you for your hours exercise. But obviously that rehabilitation side of it works, mm. doesn't it? How about you, Richard? Have your views changed since becoming a police officer? Yeah, I've realised how much more things were joined up than I thought that they were. And the example for that is you, know, you, you pull the thread uh, on mental health funding mm. and all of a sudden there, there comes a failure point and, and policing's then over the edge having to deal with unprecedented levels of mental health demand, emergency mental health yeah. demand. Uh, and behind that are years of policy of you know starts with care in the community and then not quite so much care in the community and then a bit less care in the community and it, it's choices that that are made um are you going to strive for a um lower tax economy or are you going to say well there's actually if we pull it down this far um sorry mental health provision if we pull it down this far um things will start going seriously wrong with your policing you'll stop getting the policing you want, you'll stop getting the ambulance service that you want because that we're choosing to move that demand elsewhere to emergency services. So having seen the results of it, I have more appreciation of how different aspects of policy, of government policy, will impact and sort of the laws of undesired consequences and that sort of thing. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? You know, uh, and I agree with both of you. My views have mellowed. And probably, uh, again, because of... The failure of the criminal justice system and, and people being let down 
you know, and, and that's not to say that, you know, the three of us are not soft on crime, very much the opposite, but it's, it's what's the ultimate aim of law enforcement is to make a, a, a fair and safe society, isn't it? And, you know, I'm a strong believer in rehabilitation. And if you turn out a shoplifter from prison and he's got nothing and you don't make sure he's got some provision to start life again, then he's going to turn to what he knows best, isn't he? And that's shoplifting. Or they, they meet up with somebody who they knew from inside who was stealing cars and thinks, oh, I might steal some cars. Diversify. Then. Diversify. <laughs> you know, CPD gets some uh, gets get your skill base up. What's a prison for? Uh, and, and again, are they about rehabilitation? No, that no, that. They're not about rehabilitation, otherwise they'd do more rehabilitation. Yeah. Are they about punishment? No, not even about punishment, otherwise they'd be a harsher regime. It's a temporary containment. It, it's giving the rest of us a break from yeah, the Yeah, it's a breathing space. That's all, it? that's all it is yeah. in most cases. Here's the thing for you, uh, and I've got a good example, my own personal example, but when I was in Blackpool, I arrested some animal protesters. I didn't agree with the methods that we were using and I was getting goaded. I was waiting into custody to book them in. You know, what are your views on this? What are your views on that? And I have to say that animal cruelty, I'm totally against. I agreed with their sentiment, but I didn't agree with their methods. Enter into a conversation about that. And so there's a conflict there, isn't it? Perhaps enforcing the law when your views perhaps are in sympathy with the person you're arresting. You have to park that personal stuff when you take on the job of police officer. Exactly. It used to be old manual guidance, but the, the, there's the culture within policing that you are trying to objectively enforce the law regardless of your personal sympathies with... with fear and favour, isn't it? Yeah, Without because fear you, your, your job isn't to do... I mean, the, the judge, when they're sentencing, they can, they can do that mitigation thing. Mitigation is not a thing for the investigative process. But there are jobs where it can be... I don't want to say routine because it lessens the impact, but you get what I mean. Um, the routine jobs were are of particular interest to you, Dave, not to me. I'll deal with it in 20 minutes. You could take five hours dealing with it because you'll go to the nth degree because it's of a particular interest to you. It's mm. just professional curiosity. I don't think it's... Uh, I would like to think that, you know a sympathy towards or against a certain area of investigation would lessen it. It, it is, but you, you know yourself, and we've all been to um, shoplifters uh, who, were, who were stealing food and all the rest of it, and you do a lot of digging. It's just good copying, isn't it? Yeah. Digging into the into the bones of it, really. But as far as people having political views, like demonstrations and stuff like that, but I don't think I've ever thought it. I don't think I've ever swayed from the binary decision in my head of right what's the law say what am I to do because you hit the nail on the head there Richard I said I'm introducing mitigation and I'm arguing for the prosecution and the defence at the same time to myself as the judge and you're on a real sticky wicket and you can actually do the victim a disservice that you might be trying to help mm. well no I'm out of it. it it has freed up some areas in my political life. I no longer have to be for, to forswear any political allegiances or, or be or careful not. about what I'm saying. Is this where you come out as a Tory? It's not where I come out as a Tory. <laughs> it's, well, it's, a, it's, that, well, it's that freedom of speech thing, isn't it? It is. The very first thing I, I, I did that was political, um, as I said before, I, I work at a, at a convenience store, uh, a national chain, uh, and I joined Usdor, a union. And part of that was, having been a member of the Police Federation for 30 years, I actually wanted to be a member of a union. Mm. Something that actually had, you know, organised strikes <laughs> and maybe some teeth, yeah, and, and some bargaining power. So that afternoon, everyone was out, with it. Well, no, one out, everyone out. No, no because it, it turns out that partly because we've got a, a decent union and partly because we've got decent employers, actually this time round, a lot of stuff's been done in mitigation of the cost of living crisis for yeah. us. There's been a decent pay rise. There's been a lot of other things that go on in store that are really good. The fight's already happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and I feel sort of looked after. The next thing I've done is I've decided that I'll join the Labour Party. And part of that is down to my experience in policing where I've seen my personal belief that, that 13 years of, of austerity and near austerity hasn't been good for us, hasn't got us to any place good. And that small state government is not perhaps the way I'd want things to go.
So th th there are ways I can hopefully continue to have some up impact on the society I live in, Al albeit I'm a short lever in the world, and I've always said that. But even if you're a short lever, you should still perhaps lean into things and see what you can shift if that's where your mind is, and that is where mine is. Mm. You, you volunteer. Take me out off to you. I volunteer. Do. Can I say where you volunteer or not? Yeah, I volunteer at the uh, local library in Mellor as part of the Lancashire Volunteer Partnership. Okay, so is there any part of that volunteering, which is political then, are you making any kind of statement about uh, the current government or whoever uh, uh, defunding local libraries and shutting down all these libraries? I think I'm helping to secure the library service by making my local library more useful to the people that use it because they can not only come for books, but they can come for IT advice and support and help. Uh, and it's become, uh, the last couple of weeks, I've had five, six people coming every week that, that, that want to learn a little bit more about how to use a tablet, for example, how to use the computers. It increases the reach of the library, the utility of the library, and perhaps makes it a little harder to close. So that volunteering, is it driven by your political views regarding local services? Because that's a very labour thing, isn't it? it, it it's... I think your character. Yes informs your political views it, it's it's driven by uh, an opportunity to put something back into the where i live yeah and one of the things that again being in the cops did they trained me a lot in it worked on the high-tech crime unit for a number of years uh, and having that training and that ability and being able to put it back into my local community mm. uh, after i've retired i think that that's a valuable thing to do I, it's a thing when I was coming up to retirement, I promised myself that I would get a little job in a supermarket, done that, and I promised myself I'd volunteer at a library. And that maybe goes, it's corny, but uh, Manic Street preaches, libraries gave us power. So Dave's right then, this is where I was kind of going with it. Your character informs your political views, which informs your work ethic in many ways, doesn't it? There must have been something within that character that's made you join the cops in the first place, which also leads you to want to volunteer. Yeah, people got different motivations in cops and we'll have probably three different complex motivations around here. Yeah. The, at the bottom of mine was uh, fairness. People refer to me as an agent of karma. And I quite like that description <laughs> agent of, of, karma. Of, my, of, of my policing. I was bringing karma. Sounds like a KLF album, doesn't it? Well, it, it does. It'd be a good, good title. <laughs> but it, it was... Fairness. Uh, it's something that's drilled in to me. Yeah. The oldest of four boys, for example, my dad always said a penny bun costs fourpence. As in, you'll never get for one what you can't do for the others. That fairness was yeah, yeah, in yeah. the spine of my family growing up and in me growing up. So I have a big commitment, if I can, to fairness. Okay. That, and and that, that's what sits at the bottom of my police practice, trying to be fair. Well, we've talked about character, haven't we? But I'm just wondering about personal circumstances and how that affects our politics. I mean, you know, we all remember the poll tax riots, don't we? And I was, crikey, how old was I then? Young. <laughs> um, but the poll tax actually suited me because it, it took tax away from the size of property mm. and to the individual that was living there. Mm. And I just inherited a house and I was the only one living in it and the rates fell dramatically for me. So I was all in favour of the poll tax because selfishly, my doorstep was looking quite clean and rosy. Mm -hmm. For other people who had five or six people living in the house, it was an awful time for them. So it's interesting how perhaps personal circumstances can affect your, your politics. It's always, going, it's always going to be your personal circumstances and how wealthy you feel and how different um, uh, pr uh, policies affect you. Now, at that point, were you cheering Maggie Thatcher or were you thinking, well, this I don't still don't like Maggie Thatcher, but this is a by-product? Well, I think I probably was, but because I was young and naive and didn't have a full understanding of the just how complex yeah. politics is, it was very binary, which ironically, we we started that pod, the podcast, didn't we? We were saying just how arguments are no longer nuanced now. We seem to... We seem to have taken this juvenile approach to uh, to politics. But no, at the time, you know, I, I didn't understand the bigger picture. Had I been me then, um, I would have not felt so happy about paying less um, rates on, on my property. I would say, this isn't right. And, and I would probably be against it, even though I was paying a lower cost. No, right. I, I, I would have been completely opposite. How does this affect me? Uh 
if I'm paying less, happy days. I mean, yeah, I, I support that's it. how I felt at the time. And I support it, yeah. Well, as, as age, yeah. uh, an experience of life has mellowed me, or, or in the case of Richard, lit the blue touch, pa- touch paper, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'd, I'd have a different view. I, I think it's more like snuffed out the... Um... The wick on the rocket 30 years ago, and I've now just wandered back down the garden to, to, to <laughs> gingerly put a match to it again to see what happens. I think you're one of those rockets where you light it and the fuse goes out and you go, do I go back to it? Don't go, <laughs> yeah, do not, yeah, do not approach Richard for the next 10 seconds. Yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> there is a report, which I remember reading, and it was quite interesting. They said the impact of government and politics on people's lives. If something good happens to somebody, they feel like they've got more money in the pocket. They feel it's because of their own endeavour. Mm. And if something bad happens, they've got less money in their pocket, it's because of the because of the government. So it, it, the government never get, or very rarely get, the, 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 the praise, if you will, if you feel that you've got more money in your pocket, which I thought was quite interesting because people can still be entrenched in certain political views when the current regime is actually doing them some good. On the policing side of things, just drag it back into that that area. The thing that I noticed from inside was prior to the crunch coming onto police pay and us having our pensions reorganised and having, to, to the detriment of many officers, I would say, and having our pay suppressed year on year. Yeah. Prior to that, I think most officers would be neutral towards generally conservative voting. After that, there was an awful lot of groundswell of of emotional feeling. I am never voting conservative again after what they've done to our organisation. Yeah. I must admit, I I think I fall into that camp. So do I. Yeah. I'll never vote conservative again. Because I take it personally. Because it's affected me personally. Yeah, Yeah, which was my point before, wasn't it? No, that's a sea change in policing. Oh, yeah, massively. If if you look at the Maggie era and how many uh, Conservative voters there were in the police, Mm. dear, maybe quite high, wasn't it? I mean, you know, she oversaw a massive pay rise to the police, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. Um, Because we were pretty much, back then, and it was 79, somewhere around there, where, where, you know, the police were were on its knees again, uh, and there was a massive uplift. Difficulty in recruiting... Yeah, and all, all poor they... pay and poor conditions. Yes, uh, Edmund Davies reports. I think that was back in back in the day. Yeah, uh, made recommendations which were adopted by government. But now we have this sea change, and and those it, it's either I don't vote Conservative or I will never vote Conservative again. And that's a real thing in policing. Mm. That's a real thing. I'm really conflicted and frustrated because, like you, I've taken what's happened to us in the police personally, and I will never vote Conservative again. That's just my own view. But then I look at what else is about, and I'm thinking, but who else do I vote for? Who Who is worthy of my vote? And I know, Richard, you, you now join the Labour Party. Good on you. But at the moment, I'm thinking, who is it to vote for? I've never not voted in my life, and that's the yeah. conflict, because yeah. I really feel like, do I, I don't believe in spoiling ballot papers. That's just a wasted exercise. So who do I vote for? Do I vote for a party that I agree entirely with their principles and policies, but I know will get less than 1% of the share of the vote? So what's the point? So do I do I compromise and vote for a party that's kind of in the realm of what I want and believe in? Or do you tactically, tactically vote to not get the people you don't want well, yeah, but then that's, that, again, to me, that's a waste of a vote. It's a corruption of the system. There might be people out there who agree, who are conservatives at heart. You say, right, well, what are your values? And someone said, well, I put the, your values into the computer. You are a conservative. Never vote conservative because I got shafted with my pension. And that's, what, what did they vote last time? Did they vote for Jeremy Corbyn? That's a long way to travel yeah. from centre of right to all the way to the left, isn't it? But and I people do, are like, what, who do I vote for then? But I do wonder, and Richard, now you've become a paid-up member of the Labour Party, perhaps you might be in a better position to answer. There seems to be, to me, a bit of a gap between the parliamentary party and then the actual party in Westminster. There will always be that gap, and, and the Conservatives have the same gap um, between oh, goodness, yeah. members in the... In, in the country, 
Yeah, I, I, broader I, membership. There's some very good Conservatives about, sure. uh, as are Labour and every other party. That I, I think that's the point. The difficulty you have, I think, is that what you can espouse and run with at a local level and what you can put forward to conference mm. as policy from the local level may not be what the parliamentary party feels it can get over the line with. Now, that very nicely uh, brings us towards the end of the podcast and about the police being political now. And I suppose it was inevitable, wasn't it, when, when if you make policing political, then it's not long before the police themselves become political. Unfortunately, we're not very good at playing politics and we're up against masters of the art, uh, politicians, and you will always lose in politics if you're up against them. The first part, you politicise it and, and it, it needs saying, but it... But and it just plays the nose on your face, a decision was made to make uh, the commissioning of police services and fire and rescue services in places um, subject to a locally elected politician. And although some of those initially were independent, the vast majority of those police and crime commissioners are now party political and of variable quality across the country, I'd have to say. Some seem to be quite active and, and have an understanding of it, and some are political place men or women once the person who's in charge of commissioning the policing services who's meant to call us to account is political then policing inevitably there's some bleed across the politics in, into into operational policing it can't help but not be yes they've got an oath and all the rest of it at the end of the day what gets them elected what gets them to the position where they can take it this, this is interesting job it is the endorsement of the local party and the rosette if you will Yes. Um, and they're not raised by public acclaim where people are clamouring, yes, you be our police and crime commissioner. It, it's from within the local political party yeah. saying you be our candidate for police and crime commissioner. Yeah, well, you get the rosette gets them over the line. Yes. Not the person and the policies. It's the, If you get that rosette and it's that way leaning, it's fine. Yes. But you're saying, yes, you be our police and crime commissioner. What you're actually saying is 17% of the public want you to be the police and crime commissioner, so therefore you are. Or seventy percent of the public like your rosette. Well, yeah, exactly. Seventy percent of the fifteen percent turnout. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah, because it's we've done a podcast before on the PCCs, haven't we? And the the turnout is is so low. I would even argue the legitimacy of that result, but that's a different thing. Uh, policing must become politicised when you look at, at decisions that are made and, and police forces coming underneath metro mayors and that kind of thing. Or yeah. Maryland. I mean, I, I think the police should be political, but in so much as, let's be political where our work is on the street, you know, so you can't help but notice the, the recent negativity and the armchair critics and all the rest of it. Let our work do the talking, you know. When you go and see a victim of crime, make sure you give them the gold service every time. So when the public are asked, what do you think of your local police force? They'll go... Well, actually, I remember the police visit to me, I had a really good service. Invariably, the people that don't like the police or are given a bad opinion is either because they've had a bad experience of the police or they've been an offender and basically on the, the opposite side of the fence to what we do. Let's say, for example, the College of Policing and the Police Chiefs Council become convinced that a public health approach to crime is the way to go. They should be forcefully advocating for that approach where they interface with politics at police and crime commissioner, or politics at the home uh, at the home office, or politics in, in their public pronouncements, uh, anything they put out which is published in the press, and, and I think that's probably an area where there is more debate now whether we have a joined up or public health approach to crime, and that's a political decision that we're, we're, we're going to treat it, you know, addiction as a health problem rather than a criminality problem. I don't agree that the decision decision itself is political, but the steps that would then need to be taken to lobby and enact and, and cajole, convince those that stand in Parliament, etc. That's et cetera, definitely politics. That's the political side of it. But there's a danger there of decision based on fact that you take initially, saying you want a public health approach to policing. We take that from a policing perspective. If the police are a political organisation, as in the Police and Crime Commission, it is Conservative or Labour or whatever, I'd be mindful about that original decision being seen as politically motivated. 
when it's not. Do you know what I mean? Well, um, there is no doubt at all that the police are going through some pretty stormy waters at the moment. Some of it of our own making, unfortunately. But mm. I think we just need to hold. Well, we were saying we we're retired now, but the police, they. they are the police officers of this country to carry on doing the good work that we know they're doing. Uh, to hold the nerve, and and I think in a few years' time it could be their finest hour. I really do. I'm not as convinced as you, but then I, I am naturally pessimistic about because things haven't got better for the last decade. I've been in, I've been in. I'm not seeing anything on the horizon that will make it better. But hope dies hard. As yes. They say. Yes, indeed. And the last thing to die. Right. Oh well, there's a bit of a cheery end to the podcast, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Steve, you're looking a bit depressed now. I'm Mr. <laughs> Brightside. <laughs> there's, there's some lyrics there. Right. All right. That's it for this week. All right. Cheerio. Take care, folks. Bye. Bye. The Thin Blue Mind with Bradshaw, Horton and Thomas. Policing insights and opinions.